to start the program. It's, now we have to be serious, and I would love to introduce Tony Martinetti. He is the host of Tony Martinetti Nonprofit Radio and a plan giving fundraising consultant. He has 16 years in plan giving. Nonprofit radio is heard weekly by over 9,000 fundraisers, CEOs, and board members. Tony's guests are experts and thought leaders in fundraising, board relations, volunteer management, prospect research, social media technology, and all the issues that challenge small and mid-sized nonprofits. Tony is an attorney, but he doesn't talk like one. <laughs> Please welcome Tony Martinetti. Thank you very much. We're, we're talking today about creating a culture of philanthropy throughout your nonprofit, um, especially in, in the business offices, <clears throat> in program offices, finance, uh, the other administrative offices, your CEO or executive director. I want to thank very much uh, the Association of Fundraising Professionals, New York City chapter, for hosting us at Scandinavia House. You'll be able to hear this uh, on one of two ways. It'll either be on my uh, my internet radio show, Tony Martin Eddie Nonprofit Radio, or, and or, may also be on the, the podcast that I host for the Chronicle of Philanthropy, which is called Fundraising Fundamentals. I think this is a, a crucial topic. I've had guests on talking about it in the past. Um, I was really excited by the topic because it does come up so often. How do we move others to recognize the importance of treating everyone in their daily routine in a way that they get the respect that prospects and donors deserve. And we all recognize that as, as fundraisers. But how do we get that culture to pervade throughout our organizations? That's what we really want to get to. Um, the way I'm going to define the problem briefly, because I, I think we all recognize what, what it is we're talking about, and I want to get to some ideas that the panelists have that, that you can take away. Um, Money is left on the table when fundraising prospects and donors aren't treated like fundraising prospects and donors. Uh, revenue is lost when non-fundraisers hurt or even just miss opportunities to further relationships that all the fundraisers are working so hard to, to cultivate and build. And we do want to give you ideas that you can execute or at least given the realities of, of an organization, go back and ask for authority to execute in your, in your offices. Want to introduce our uh, very esteemed panel. Next to me is Terry Billy. She's the Director of Foundation and Corporate Relations for Goodwill Industries International. Next to Terry is Matt Bregman. He's the Vice President for Development at Brooklyn Academy of Music, BAM. And Brian Saber, he's the president of Asking Matters. Please join me in uh, welcoming our panelists. Uh, Brian, let's start with you down the end. Um, are we, are we uh, dealing with a lack of awareness in, uh, among non-fundraisers? Uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. You're good. on, we hear you. I'm on. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that uh, many in, 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 at, at many organizations, there is an insular na nature, to the, unfortunately, to the fundraising operation. Um, oftentimes, even physically, there is. I've seen uh, many organizations where the, f the fundraising team is not even in, in, on the same uh, floor, in the same building, on the same campus. They tend to be the first people who are, are put someplace else. I see some of you nodding, which is just the wrong place for fundraisers. It, it, it's like you know, it's like this bull, bullpen idea, which has its pluses and minuses. But but if you want everyone interacting and on the same page, then they need to physically be together and understand each, because that helps them understand each other's roles. Uh, so I, 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 there's a lot of isolation in the field, and that yeah. doesn't help us because it does take everyone. Yeah, Matt, are we uh, are we siloed? Do fundraisers bear part of the blame? Uh, I, I guess uh, I don't know if fundraisers bear part of the blame. I think that we need to, uh, I think part of our job needs to be to persuade the entire organization that, um, you know, to, to 
demystify fundraising in a way that it doesn't feel scary. Maybe there's a way in which fundraising winds up getting isolated a little bit physically and psychologically and emotionally because there feels like there's something slightly scary about it. And the reason, I think, is that there's an assumption that fundraising is about going out and trying to convince people to do something they don't really want to do in some uh, manipulative way. And that feels uncomfortable to a lot of people. And so they want to kind of divorce that from the rest of the organization. And I think that we all need to continuously remind our peers that it's just about relationship building and that everyone uh, uh, can play a huge role by helping to build those relations and w relationships. So as long as we're all trying to build relationships, we're all part of one organization. And, and I think everyone can feel comfortable with that. And Terry, there are plenty of things that non-fundraisers can do to create this culture of philanthropy aside from asking for money. Oh, ab plenty. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, whether you have people in your shop or in your admissions area or you know, they just need to interact with people. They need to make sure that they're doing good customer service, that the experience that they've had with your organization is a positive one because they're the front face of your organization. And if they somehow um, make the person have an uncomfortable position, you're, you're starting backwards from wanting to reach them to make a contribution to your organization. So aside from customer service, do we have other ideas of ways that, or, or maybe we can be more specific in, in defining customer service, but what, what can we encourage our, our colleagues to, uh, to be thinking about as they're doing their day-to-day -day jobs outside, outside fundraising? Brian, looks like you have something? Well, that anyone who crosses their path could be a donor. Uh, could be or could be a member of the community and have a role and a say in the direction of the organization. Uh, I worked at Hudson Gill, one of the old settlement houses in New York for eight years, and lots of people would just come by, right, and walk in off the street. And you wanted everyone to understand that anyone walking in could, could be a current donor, a board member, uh, could be a prospective uh, a donor, community member, uh, and, and, you, and you want them to have the best impression from the very beginning. Uh, and you just can't, you can't make assumptions about who is, who's in your facility and, and who people are. So are we encouraging our colleagues then to treat everyone as a potential donor? Right, and some of it, as Terry says, is just good basic customer service and customer relations. You want to treat everyone well. But if you have in the back of your mind that some of these people can also be donors to your organization, and you have a bit more information maybe than you would otherwise, given your role, that's going to be very helpful. Uh, Brian, you have experience when you were at Hudson yeah. Guild yeah. executing a program around yes. what we're, yes. exactly what we're talking about. Yes. Want to share some sure. really tips, ideas? Sure. How, do, how can fundraisers get started creating this culture? Mm -hmm. Well, at Hudson Guild, we, we, did, we had a two-pronged approach, uh, because we realized there were, that everyone needed to be sensitive to fundraising, understand what it was and what their role could be. And then there was a group that was going to be more directly involved, namely program directors and executive staff and a few others. So we, we created programs for everyone and then more intensive training for the, the people who would be leading visits, um, demonstrating in the Head Start classroom or the after school. So we're actually talking about formalized training. Formal, yes, it was formalized. So for the, for the group that would be more involved, which was really program managers and executive staff, we held a quarterly training. We tied some of it to quarterly other staff development where we would focus specifically on fundraising and, and everyone's role and what it means when donors come by and how we treat them and what we say, how to identify them if you, they have their own contacts and so forth. And, and we did that quarterly where we would take a couple of hours every quarter. And, and, and this was led by the fundraising staff or even though it was high-level staff development, it wasn't an um, uh, executive staff function or an executive director function, it was a fundraising staff function so that it really had, so it had the right agenda. And then for the entire staff, uh, we, we, we had uh, a, a few projects. We annually, uh, and we built it, we built, built build it as team building, but it was also run by the fundraising department we would have an in-service day once a year uh, where we would do a variety of things from having each uh, department create a skit 
that actually showed what their department did, sometimes in a very humorous way, but in a way that, was, uh, that, that people could understand and, and be engaged in. We would do things like a scavenger hunt, so people would have to go to the various sites. If you know Hudson Guild, there are five separate program sites. And some people never got left one building and went to the other. Those who were in the, the children's center were there constantly, and that's eight blocks from the senior center. People never even saw the other parts of the institution. So we'd, we set up, uh, there was a physical part of the day where you had to cover the whole campus and find things and ask trivia questions. So then you had to go find people in other departments and ask them about their programs and get answers. Well, how many children do you serve here? And how many meals do you serve in the senior center every day? And how many children are in the after school program and such? So we would make a very a fun, engaging day that was general team building, but it was really all focused on fundraising. And then we would also require all staff, uh, I, I'll, I'll forget how many times a year, it might have been four, to make a one to two hour visit to various programs four times a year. So everyone from maintenance staff to the executive director each quarter had to go visit a program and watch it in action. It was really effective. Those are excellent. Um, Terry, you have a background in, in some customer service work. What, what can you add for, for fundraisers who want to execute a, a program like this? Well, one of the things that um, both here at um, Goodwill one of the things that we're doing with Goodwill is we do a roundup at our shops. And so we need to train our staff that are in the stores to ask people to round up their purchase. And we need to in, uh, train them to know about the program. So for example, we did a roundup over July and August all about backpacks for kids for schools. So of course we had to train the, kit, train the, the, the staff to know about the backpacks for schools and how to ask and, and what to do if they said no and you know how to how to meet objections. So it was a really simple thing. It was a really um, low kind of stress way to interact with the customer. And you know, more often than not, people could round up if they couldn't round up a buck, they could round up you know fifty cents or something like that. And over a two month period, we made ten thousand dollars. Just you know, just because it was supporting the backpacks for kids, for needy kids, for schools. Um, another thing that you do is, what that I do is, whenever I'm having a site visit with a funder, a corporate or foundation funder, um, I work with the program staff, not so much the the head program, like the director of education, but the person that's managing the after school program, and have them interact with me, with the funder to have a conversation. I had this happen yesterday and she saw, I asked her to do a tour. You know, we had a meeting before the, before the, uh, the site visit. I asked her to do a tour. I asked her to, you know, what to set up. And we had the tour and had conversation. It was very low key and very comfortable. And then later we went back to her office and we talked about her needs and, and, the funder is going to support us and has come up with some other opportunities outside of her organization to help, you know. So it's, it's about engaging your other fundraise, your other non-fundraising staff because they have the passion about the, the, the program that they're doing. It's much better to have the funder hear from them than to hear it from you, the development person. They appreciate it more. Uh, and I, I should have mentioned earlier, we are going to have time for questions. Um, at the end, plenty of, plenty of time to have your questions answered. Uh, we'll, we'll take them at the end. All right, so please hold. And we do want to hear from you. We want to make this uh, a dialogue as well. So write your questions down. We want, we're, we're, we're desperate for them. Well, we're not desperate, but <laughs> I wouldn't say we're desperate, but we're anxious. Because there's, there's a shade of difference, I think, between desperation and anxious anxiety. We're fundraisers, so we're always right. a little desperate, I think. Excellent. Matt, <laughs> Matt, great. I was going to turn to you. Thank you. Um, all right. Chief fundraiser, uh -huh. how are we going to start to overcome reluctance among program staff, finance, business offices, uh, peers of yours? How would, how would we start to break down the reluctance to spend the time that Brian and Terry are talking about in training? when they don't see that as their, as their role? Well, you know, um, as I think about these questions, I, I, I realize that 
a lot of what is necessary for an organization to be a powerful fundraising organization really has to come from the leadership. I mean, we in the, if we're not the leadership, then we have to do our best to educate and influence the leadership of the organization. But ultimately, the more the leadership buys into the idea of fundraising, the more successful you're going to be. And I, I, you know, I have a feeling about this, which is that every organization really ought to have two missions. And the first mission is whatever the, the external social capital mission of the organization is, whether it's to deliver great artistic programming or deliver uh, meals or you know, help to provide affordable housing, whatever it is, that's one mission. But the other mission of the organization needs to be to raise the money necessary to accomplish the first mission. And that, that, that the commitment to the second mission is absolutely crucial. And if the leadership of the organization doesn't buy into it, if they resist that, if they think of fundraising as kind of a necessary evil, then you're always going to be in a, in a challenged position as a fundraising organization. So unfortunately, we can't necessarily wave a magic wand and transform our organizations that way. But hopefully, you, you know, we all in our careers gravitate toward those, toward, toward those organizations that have that uh, philosophy or try to influence that to happen. And I think that there's a lot of ways in which the organization can realize its second mission, its mission of raising the money. And, and so, and some of them I think are, you know, maybe sort of marginally politically incorrect, but I think it's the reality of fundraising. So just as an example, talking about customer service, you know, it's absolutely crucial, I agree with everything everyone has said, that uh, customer service be excellent across the board, because, I mean, we have this, we're a theater, and, um, you know, it happens where, uh, you know, a, a, a front of house staff member is perceived to be a little rude or, I mean, we try to, I think we have a fantastic front of house, so I don't want to be on record sort of making it seem like they're not. It's just an example. It's yeah, a it's hypothetical. Exa hypothetically. But if they, you know, if they tell someone in, a, in a, an abrasive way where the show started and, you know, there's the, the, you can't go in for 10 minutes in a rude way as opposed to a friendly way, someone who's been supporting us for a long time uh, or is thinking about supporting us obviously could get turned off. Not but, to mention that person may have a smartphone and access immediately to their Twitter stream, yeah. their Facebook page, That's right. and, and bash bam. That's right, which um, yeah, it could, could happen hypothetically. But, um, <laughs> so, but the thing is that at the same time, the sort of contrarian and maybe slightly politically incorrect thing is that I, you know, I often think in fundraising it's a little bit like uh, you know, um, Animal Farm by George Orwell. You know, all, I think all customers are created equal, but some are more equal than others. And if you have, you know, for example, if we're at BAM and there's a sold out show and there's suddenly two tickets are left and there's 10 people waiting for them and one of them is a $100,000 donor and the others aren't donors, you know, the democratic thing to do would be to say, well, let's all just draw, you know, straws. But everyone at BAM understands, you know, I better let the guy, the people who give us $100,000 to see the show. And in a way it's elitist and in a way it's only fair because we wouldn't be able to do the show if we didn't have the people who gave us $100,000. So, um, you know, whether it's right or wrong, that's how we approach life at, at BAM. And we're a, a very much a fundraising organization. It comes from the top down. Everyone's bought into it. Everyone understands that everyone deserves great treatment and that there's a limit to that kind of uh, you know, preferential treatment and that it has to be appropriate and within bounds and all of that. But at the same time, you know, you gotta, you got to think about who's providing you with uh, the funding. I'm going to push you a little further because you're the vice president on the, on the panel. Uh -huh. uh, let's assume hypothetically you have a, a difficult uh, CFO who doesn't accept this culture of, of philanthropy as part of their responsibility. What are you going to say to that person? Well, you know, so this is an inter interesting thing. What I have found in my career is if my, it really comes down to how strongly my boss is bought into this. So I have worked in places where the boss will side with the CFO, or one day side with the CFO and one side day side with me. And then, you know, it's, it, it really has stopped what we were able to accomplish in other organizations I've worked at. Where I work now, the CFO will understand, you know, not only am I going to have to fight with Matt, but I'm going to have to fight with my boss, you know, our boss about this. And it's just easier unless I, you know, sometimes we'll take a principled stand. You know, if, uh, if someone said, and this happens, I mean, more or less, hypothetically, someone says, oh, can you, you know, bend these rules or I want to give this donation, but pretend I gave a bigger donation and write me a letter saying that and I'll get a refund and I'll save money in taxes. At some point, the CFO is going to say, we're not doing that. It's not legal. It's not ethical. And that's, we all respect that. And I, my boss will respect that. You know, we're going to push it, but not to the point where we're doing things that are unethical or illegal. 
Um, but uh, if the CFO, when you, have, when you have a lack of leadership in an organization, in my experience, and then the fundraising staff has to fight with the marketing staff and the CFO and all the other program staff about these things because there's not a clear direction. Look, in the end, you know, we want to do everything within our power to maximize our fundraising opportunity. If you don't have that culture, then you have these internal fights and you start to have breakdowns and opportunities are lost. So it really, you know, we, I, I, just to add one thing to that, because we are, um, you know, because we can't necessarily control our director, the one thing I think we can do as fundraisers is just, and this has worked for me more or less throughout my career, is just try to be the best colleagues possible all the time. So I'm always encouraging my staff, if someone, if the finance department says, you know, we really need people, the audit's coming and we need people to help, you know, move stuff out of the conference room, let's volunteer, let's help, let's be good colleagues to the, finance department so that when it's time for us to ask for a favor, they're, they're good colleagues to us. We can't really afford, you know, it's not about us, it's about our donors and our jobs raising money. So anything we can do to build relationships within the organization so that people can help us to raise money is something that we ought to be doing. So I always encourage that. The same effort, in other words, that goes into building donor relationships, exactly. build relationships with your colleagues. Absolutely. Brian, it looked like you have advice for, uh, well, go ahead, what, what do you want to contribute? Yes, to? well, I want to pick up on the idea of leadership because we, we have, there are two prongs here. We want everyone to be sensitized to, the, to what fundraising is and, and, and their role and customer service, but it does start at the top. And I work with a number of organizations uh, where the fundraising staff's primary challenge is that the CEO or executive director doesn't see his or her role in fundraising uh, and isn't out there fundraising, and, and in many cases is the best spokesperson for the organization, but isn't making that impact. And the kind of change that we're talking about has to come from the top. That's right, been said. right. So, I mean, certainly at, at, at Hudson Guild, my executive director was very willing to let fundraising uh, plant, put together this program, which was great, but the other part of my role uh, in my years there, I spent six as deputy be before becoming executive director, was to engage my executive director in fundraising. Um, admittedly, she, she had not been uh, involved in fundraising with individuals, which is often the case. People, uh, uh, many times leadership's wonderful with foundations and corporations and, and, and maybe at special events and speaking, but when it comes to cultivating and soliciting major donors, many of them, especially those who've been there a long time from an earlier model, aren't involved and you have to start with them. And I was just... Right. And so, but I'm going to yeah. challenge you. Uh, yeah. How are we going to get that started? Yeah. What, what can people take away to initiate right. that conversation? Well, I often tell people, think of your executive director more as a board member. Because you're not going to get from zero to 60, but you can get from zero to 20, which means what I, what I tell people with board members is, you know, focus them, ask, the, you know, Maybe they don't start by asking, but they start by opening doors, or they start by being part, a part of those various conversations and being in on more meetings. And maybe you start with a few, you start with three or four, or you identify, I often tell people, you know, identify the easier asks and, and bring an executive director in on the easier asks and start to build that relationship, and also carve out time. It's important to try and get some regular time on your executive director's calendar so that fundraising starts to become more of the culture. So it could it, be an hour a week or okay, every other so week or something. So you're asking for devoted like time. Devoted that time you can, for fundraising. You can, you can put right. on their calendar. And, 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 and some of it, it, it is happening already probably where you're discussing upcoming grant proposals or reports or something like that or their visits. But, but that's a place to start to incorporate more of the individual work, which, I mean, certainly from my point of view is critical since most gifts come from individuals and that tends to be where many of us fall short. So, Terry, yeah. you want to weigh in on, uh, on leadership and, and motivating leadership? Well, not so much on the motivating leadership, but the building relationships with the other departments. Um, I am one of the, I work for one of these organizations where the development department is in a totally different building in a different borough from where everything else happens. <laughs> Not at all isolated. <laughs> We're in our white tower here in Manhattan. Um, uh, and all of our programs are in Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx. And so, and our headquarters are in Astoria. So we need to go to Astoria and we need to go to different sites to meet with our staff and to learn about what their programs are and to 
like be familiar with them so they know who we are when we call them up to say, hey, I'd like to learn more about what you're doing. And so we're going to be setting up actually a kind of monthly meeting. Actually, we also, we also have a location in New Jersey, Harrison, New Jersey. So we're going to be setting up meetings with th these different departments so that we can kind of sit in on their monthly meetings and hear what's going on and kind of feel like we're part of their team and they're part of our team so that we can all be on the same page because we're totally siloed when we're trying to find information from them. They don't think of us as, oh, we should tell them we're developing this new program. I have to go out and ask them. Okay. So this, this is a, a, an ideal situation to talk about. What, what else are you doing to, to create this culture, to, to, to build those bridges with colleagues? Well, it's, it's all about, like yesterday, going on a site visit with the colleague to, and talking to them before the site visit and talking to them before the funder meeting. Were, were they willing to go or did you have to No, persuade? they were willing to go. They were willing to go. They were a little nervous. So I had to say, you know, this is just going to be the three of us. We're just going to have a conversation. I want to, it's your opportunity to talk about your program and shine, you know, um, and get, get them excited about what you're doing, you know. Um, and it was an after school program in Long Island City that serves 200 kids and you know you do great work and there was a real rapport that that came about and people they they loved it so it's about having that transformational experience with your both your funder and your staff people to see that it's not that scary it's you know you're you're just talking about you know you're building a relationship you're building a friendship you're building a a, a foundation for future conversation. Matt, sounds like at BAM, uh, this, uh, this culture pervades, I, I think you had said, all, all levels, yeah. from front of house staff to uh, facilities, maintenance. I mean, how do you, how do you talk to the, to the people who are the most removed from fundraising and, and have the sort of the slightest contact, but still have contact with, with your, your donors and prospects? You know, it's, it's, first of all, it's easier said than done. I mean, I'm sort of tempted to pontificate about this, and then in the back of my mind thinking, I don't do any of this no, stuff. Don't be bullshitting us here. <laughs> no, we're going to see through that. But, uh, you know, I think what's really important is, you know, for us all to remind ourselves, and certainly including me, that um, we need to find opportunities to introduce funders to staff at all level and to, to, to you know, again, to, to demystify it. I think a lot of staff, even, even colleagues, other vice presidents, in some cases, I think at BAM, still picture the board of directors and our biggest donors as like, I, I don't know, a group of people out of a Rembrandt painting or something, you know, these sort of like, you know, regal, removed, you know, people, even though they've met a lot of them. And I think that, um, you know, so somehow we have to get them to have a different image in their mind that these people who are funding us are people that, like them, are passionate about the organization and are, are normal people. Now, you know, so I think that that something that we do, at least within the development staff, at least within the junior staff in, in, in development, is that everyone knows that they, as long as they're polite and appropriate, they're encouraged to interact with uh, with trustees, certainly, and with donors. And so when we have receptions, and you know, for example, at BAM, is is an example that we do and could do more of. So we have a patron table every single night that we have a show. The, our patrons, people who are giving $1,000 or more, pick up their tickets at a special table, and the patron desk provides those. But you can also volunteer to, to work at that table. Now, the more that people are at that table and actually see the people who are supporting us and meeting them and chatting with them and seeing that almost, you know, they're almost all basically nice people, at least if you're nice to them and, and not in a negotiation or something, then um, it starts to demystify it, and then they start to feel like they have an understanding, at least they have the right image in their mind of who this other scary group of people are out there. So that doesn't, you know, I think as human beings we have a tendency, I, I think it's evolutionary, although I don't know that much about it, that, um, you know, if there's another group of people and we don't know much about them and they're not us, then we, you know, it seems like by evolution we are scared of them and want to destroy them or something. And this has, you know, been the history of the world for several thousand years and or more. And um, so I think that a little bit of that happens. So if you're in the programming department and you don't know who this board is and who these donors are, you think that this scary group of people and, and then people are scared of them and they don't, and then if, if for some reason they're in a situation with them, they clam up, they feel like they have to make some speech, they wear a suit, 
you know, they do all sorts of things that, uh, you know, make them feel very uncomfortable. And so the more that we can, in, you know, democratize that and integrate them and bring them into these experiences, I think everyone benefits from it. And, you know, all of us do, don't do it enough. I think the donors and the board members also like to see who are the people behind the, uh, you know, in those back offices, who's, what's really happening in this organization. You know, we tend to think, because we live it every day, that everyone is aware of what's happening every day in our organizations. But I think the, a, a lot of the, um, you know, I think that board members and donors want so much to, to be allowed into the kitchen, to see how, how is the soup made, what's really happening here. That's kind of why they're involved in the first place. And, you know, so let's get the cooks out to meet them more and more, and I think that, that benefits everyone. Brian, can you say a little about the, the psychology of um, thinking about, you know, other, other groups of people, the way, the way Matt's describing, um, and, and how to break down those, those, those walls? Well, one of the things we, we have to make sure not to do in fundraising is assume other people know anything. I mean, right, we, 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 with, it starts with board members. I do a lot of work with boards and board members, and we, we assume because we're sending board members all this information that they know what's going on, and then they haven't read it, or they haven't internalized it, or, or such. And that's very true with everyone at the organization. We assume... I mean, we may have a staff newsletter, and we put stuff in the newsletter, and so we assume people have read it, and therefore they know of all the great things that f the fundraising department is helping to make happen, when in fact they actually don't. Uh, they need to get that information in a different format, or they need to be told verbally, or they need uh, in their individual uh, department staff meetings to hear some of it, to have visits or something. I think we need to, so I, I think we need to not assume what people know, and always find different ways to provide that information. Do you have advice uh, for the work that you did at Hudson Guild around creating this, the, the program and the training um, for dealing with the, again, the, the people that have the least contact but still have some contact with constituents, how to, how to bring those people specifically into, the, into this culture? Right. Well, uh, I, I think the, this idea of doing it as part of team building uh, is, 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 is very helpful and, and to have everyone together. Uh, so, you know, it tends to be the, that mostly the, the people higher up at Hudson Guild had more donor contact because they were on the visits, they were at the board meetings and so forth. And I wanted to make sure that it didn't feel like we versus they. So a lot of the training was meant to bring everyone together, break down those barriers and have people at all levels of the institution and throughout all the programs working with each other. And I think that helps a lot. Um, rather than thinking, okay, well, you know, the receptionists need a certain training. I think what they need is the confidence and the exposure to everyone else as much as something specific. Now, it, does that mean we didn't try to say, you know, if, if, so, if a donor comes, this is what you should do. If someone asks about this, you should do that. We did, and we had you know, just you know, very simple sheets that answered a couple of basic questions. Uh, but beyond that, we treated them as part of the greater group, and that seemed to be effective. I feel like we've, we've hit on a lot of very good ideas and some themes as well. Um, I, I'd like to open it up for questions. I feel like, I was just feeling like there may be things out there that we haven't hit on and I want to make sure that we do. Please, go ahead. And I'm going to repeat the questions to, for our listening audience. Go ahead. Hi. Um, how would you break down what you're saying for a small organization that doesn't have departments but that has, say, nine people? Uh, advice for small organizations. The example is nine nine people, um, with all the shared responsibilities that a small organization like that has. Who wants to take that? Uh, I, okay, you want to go? I guess um, my initial thought is that, in a sense, it's easier because at least you can get everyone in a room and say, "Listen, let's let's understand here that um, you know we are." And if we're going to thrive, we all need to be on board with the idea of fundraising, and let's take some time to think about what that means. And, you know, and then to get past that initial shock of thinking, oh, no, we're all supposed to go out to Tin Cup on the subway and make a speech and ask people to put money in it, which, I, you know, and then people think, I, I don't want to do that. I didn't sign up for that. But if people understand, no, what we're saying is that there's a role that everyone in this organization can play, and, and it, it, it could actually be, I think, be very specific about it. And, you know, there's some, pr some principles that we need to adhere to, um, and, um, you know, and just if I could take this moment to say it, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that whether you're a large organization or a small organization, you need to adhere to. And, and 
so one of them is transparency, that you know, we all need to understand that when we're dealing with anyone, especially our donors, that a principle we're going to have is transparency, that if someone asks a question about what we're doing or how our finances work or anything, that they're going to feel like they get a quick response, they get a, an honest response, an understandable response, that everyone has responsibility for that. And that there's, just to use another example, uh, um, I, I call it sharing the franchise, meaning that we're all going to understand that we want to invite people into this organization and make them feel like they're a part of it and look for opportunities to do that. So if we're having a brainstorming session about you know, what we're going to do next year, let's automatically think, are there some funders, are there some board members that we can include in this process? Every move we make, let's think, is this an opportunity? Sometimes it's not appropriate, but mostly it is. Is this an opportunity to get some of these people who are interested in our organization involved in that process? All this relationship building, not only in terms of customer service, which is absolutely important at, that, at the sort of uh, user level, but in terms of bringing them into the, the kitchen again so that they feel like they're part of this organization. Let's always be looking for those opportunities. So I think, you know, in a way, it's, it could, you know, the ability to, to send the right message or the wrong message is easier probably in a small organization. It's harder to execute a lot of the ideas. You know, let's, you know, have a, a full day of training for the board or something. It's harder when you've got only nine people maybe than when you have two staff people just dedicated to board training or to board relations. But at least to get everyone agreeing on what we ought to be doing as an organization might be easier. Right. You want to add? Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, demonstrating results is also a, an important part of this. Uh, showing how the fundraising has impacted the various programs and made things possible. And the small organization has the advantage that they can bring everybody together and to do that. Do right, that. right, right. And, 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 and it's, it's, it should be more obvious, I would think, in a small organization, right, because you don't have these disparate programs and sites and, and a big bureaucracy that can that can stop it. You're smiling and it, does that mean you're not having that there? <laughs> you do you do have that? We do have that. You do have that, okay, yeah. Um, you have the bureaucracy you're saying and everything? You do. That's yeah, a, yeah, that's a struggle in a small organization. Uh, but it but demonstrating the impact uh, is, is really important. I worked for an organization that had a lot of government contracts. Um, for better and often for worse. And, uh, and without the private fundraising, none of those contracts were a actually ended up being worthwhile. So we could, we could show what, those con what the private fundraising was bringing to each of the programs, and that, that helped people understand the importance of them being involved. Because you know, understandably, people are saying, well, I have my job. You know, you're not helping me teach. You're not helping me serve. You're not helping me seat people. Or so why, you know, why am I helping you? And it's because that it, because the funds are coming back to you and at the programs, right? We're doing this all for the programs. Terry, advice for the small organization. Um, I really think um, that again, it's all about building consensus among the different people. I've, I've worked in a small organization um, a couple of times and trying to get everyone together. Sometimes it's really tough to get all like nine or 12 people together in a room because we, you are having a small staff, so everyone is hugely busy and they, don't, they can't you know, do that. So that's where the development department needs to go out to the each person and say, okay, let me have a meeting with you to talk about and see you know what, you know how you can help, how you can participate, and and what's doable and what's not doable. You know you need to find out because people when when you have a really small organization, people don't have the time. So you just got to find the simplest thing that they're willing to do to get them to feel involved. Other questions, uh, please right up front. What is your connection to the mission 
commitment to the mission yeah. through, throughout yeah. and, and how to identify it and, 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 uh, and strengthen it. You want, Terry? Sure. Um, well, one place that I worked, we did kind of like a job shadowing. So we wanted to have everyone, this was a morale builder, and we wanted everyone to know what everyone else did in their job. And so it was an opportunity, again, for people to kind of say, okay, well, I don't really know what the people in the front admissions area do. I know that they, you know, bring in the people and they, they sell tickets and all that kinds of stuff. So we would have people from different departments share, like spend a day or, yeah, it was a day, um, kind of shadowing that other person's job. So it was really an opportunity to learn about their mission, their their commitment to their job and their commitment to their mission and 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 kind of it broke down barriers and silos. Um, you know, there was a lot of also eye rolling, of like, oh, okay, now we got to do this happy joy joy thing. But um, <laughs> you know, but it really did in the end make people understand what other people did and and made people feel more all on board. Right. You, you had to yeah. I, well, I have found over the years, and I've mostly worked for smaller organizations. Hudson, besides, uh, I, I, I did major gift fundraising for my alma mater, but besides that, Hudson Guild was the largest organization I worked for, and that was $6 million, and many of them were as small as 500,000. I loved the small organizations. And, and generally, I found that the program staff were incredibly engaged and got it, and the, it was more challenging with, let's say, the finance department or another department where it just didn't have a lot of natural interaction with the programs and with, and with uh, clients and participants. Uh, but incredible engagement from, from uh, the program staff. Uh, th that's just been my experience uh, that, that I've had to work more on. I, 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 I would come back often to the finance uh, the finance and administration staff. That, that tended to be the one where I had to do the the, uh, the, the, the group I had to do the most work with. But also it's interesting when, I, this has been a dilemma for me forever, a philosophical dilemma that I haven't resolved. And that is, um, yes, it's the nonprofit world and, the, and, the non and our nonprofit has a mission. And, and those of us in more senior positions, I should hope, especially those of us who are fundraisers are passionate about what our organizations are doing. But I'm also a believer that a lot of people need a job, and these are important jobs. The nonprofit sector is a huge part of society, and I don't expect everyone to drink the Kool-Aid. I expect them to do their work, and, and I've been an executive director twice, and in that role, I felt you know they need to do their work and earn their paycheck and feed their families, and I hope that we can develop something, but, but I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, but it needs to be gentle because they have a right to come here and work just because that's where their job is. That, I, and that might be radical in this field, I don't know, but I've always, I, it's always created a bit of a conundrum for me. There, especially there are limits with, to, to there are limits, Especially with staff, you know, fundraising from the staff. That's been a huge issue for me over the years, whether you ask the staff to give mm -hmm. and when. And I've done it in only a very limited way because I, I just think it creates undue pressure. So, and, and I know a lot of people feel very differently about that, but that, that's just been, for me, something for the last 30 years. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to just want to add one thing to what you're saying, which is that um, I think that uh, on the other hand, at least thinking about the people on the front lines who are really interacting with the public, that um, it's very important for us to have any the influence that we can across the organization in terms of hiring people, whether they're passionate about the mission or not. We're just inclined to be happy and friendly and helpful. And that, uh, you know, I always find when I hire people in general, at least within my department, I tend to be more interested in people's personality and their, their, their enthusiasm about life than I am in their resume. I mean, that, you know, at some point people have to have the right skills, but if I have to choose, I'll choose attitude over experience and skills most of the time. And I think that um, making sure that anyone who is going to interact with the public just by their nature as someone who likes to be friendly and helpful is absolutely crucial. We, we did this little um, training one day with, uh, the, I guess, the hospitality group that Danny Meyer, the restaurateur, 
runs, and they were talking about how important it is to them. And they have, you know, they, and I was very interested in this. They have, you know, specific things that they do in the interviews to try to figure out who's really a friendly, happy person who wants to be helpful and who's just acting that way in the interview. And I think it's important to be able to make that distinction. I don't know that I can always do it perfectly, uh, but I want to get better and better at it because you just never know. I mean, you know, it, it should be the truth. It should be the case for everyone, obviously, but especially for our donors that they love interacting with the staff. And I think that if you're a grumpy, unhappy person who's, you know, sort of bitter and annoyed at people, no matter how many trainings we bring them into, they're, that's kind of how they are, and then they resent the trainings. So, you know, I think we have to hire happy people. I think it's really an important thing in the organization. It can make all the difference. You never know how many people you're losing because they had some bad experience. I know if I get a call from, you know, if I call a company that, uh, you know, I'm having a customer service problem with and I have a bad experience with the people, person on the phone, I just in my bones believe I just talked to the CEO of the corporation and the whole corporation is evil and horrible because I don't think, well, that's just the person. It has nothing to do. They hired this person and then I just think, like, I hate that company because, they, you know, they were so uh, intransigent with me. So I think that everyone has that experience. And, and, and so that's one thing that we can do is influence the, the kind of happy people to get hired. I'm glad you, you brought in the hiring process because yeah. that is important. I think we have time for one more question. Is there another? Please. Sure. Um, so can you speak a little bit about after a given company? Do you think it's more difficult for your staff members to um, talk to your ship and how that's still a really important role in our question is about stewardship after after the gift comes and and the culture of philanthropy. Who wants to? Brian, I'll touch on it. I think I, when you're a multi-service organization, I think it's more challenging because you really need the the, the input from the various programs. I, I I was going to touch on this earlier. Actually, um, it's important to get the program staff in discussions with you as fundraising staff before you're out there putting, you, before you put out proposals. Uh, what, even if the program's in place, I think it's important to get recent data and a pulse from the program people before you start selling those programs uh, so that you're representing the programs properly and you understand what the outcomes are supposed to be so that when it comes time for reporting, you have some valid benchmark to work off of. Because what I used to find was it would, it, would, I, it, would, I, it would be time for reporting, and then I'd find out that the program person didn't actually understand what we committed to in the proposal because the program person wasn't involved in the first place. And now we had to, we had to back out of that somehow. So I think on the, on the, on the, you know, on the near end, it, the involvement by program people and a sign off on what you're actually proposing to do so this is much more for the institutional proposals, but for some high-end uh, individual donors too, you need to know. You need to bring them, engage them in advance. So and and then it helps with the stewardship af af afterward. It certainly helps with the reporting and getting the right information. Terry, anything you want to add? Stewardship. Right. Oh, well, same thing. I would also, if we're submitting a proposal and we get the proposal, I send a copy of that proposal to the program staff so they have it either a briefing memo or something just so they know okay so these are our you know these are our goals and objectives and outlines and you know this is what we all talked about so and we always co-write proposals I mean so if I'm writing a draft I'll send it to them saying okay what do you think this is you know from our conversation this is what we talked about just you know clarify or remove or come up with questions etc and I'll do the same so that everyone is on the same page so that when it's time to do the report or have the the next meeting with the funder um, everyone knows what they're talking about while Brian was t talking I took advantage of reading the the time off his watch and uh, we do have some more time so are there are there more questions yeah my sense was a little off please Advice when uh, a lot of the funding is from government contracts. 
Uh, yeah, you know, it's hard because people get really dependent on it, and it, even though the contracts are difficult, in, in a way, it's, you know, every year comes. You can get very used to that, and then they get cut a little bit by a little bit, um, uh, and, and, and you're, you're fine. You've got to find funds just to keep the status quo, not even push, and they're saying, you know, what do you mean, and you've already asked me to cut it. I, I, I don't, dialogue, I, I don't know that I have anything really special to say, except that a lot of communication is necessary, because sometimes the program staff, they don't understand what that means. Why is the program being cut? What has to be taken out? I think having them involved in those decisions is important, and I'm assuming that happens, but um, hopefully if they're really committed to their programs and they see the, what the cuts are going to do, that will help them get more engaged in another solution, which is private philanthropy. Um, but I, I don't know that it, that's, I don't know whether what I said Could is really brief, helpful, Briefly? <laughs> briefly, I don't know if I'm capable of being brief, but... Um, Challenging you again. <laughs> the only thing I want to say about that is that, um, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, it, you know, some, something uh, we, we're always saying in the nonprofit world is, oh, government's coming back and government's coming back and it's so difficult. And what we used to say a lot, I don't know if we say it as much anymore, is, oh, in Europe, this is especially true in the arts, you know, all of the all of the art stuff is supported by the government, and here we have to struggle and try to piece it together privately. And I actually feel, and, and I know my boss feels this way too, we actually like it better this way, right? Because it makes you have to play your best game every day. It forces makes you, you hungry. It makes you hungry, and you have to put on your best face, and you have to, you have to compete, and that brings excitement and, and makes you a better organization for it. And, I, and again, I think that, um, you know, if the the organization needs to be populated by people who have that attitude. Like, let's go and let's let's have a vision for what this could be, and it could be even bigger and better. And let's you know, let's be excited about that, and let's try to find the people who can help us to get there. And if if you you know if it gets stagnant and there's you know a way we do it and we get the support and we have to follow these rules, I don't I think that's not uh, congruous with a um, with a fundraising culture. So you know, again, people either have to get on board with a new attitude about being excited about the hunt, or you know, maybe it's not the you know the change in culture is not the right place for them. Terry, uh, Terry. Well, I I also work in a social service agency, and we are dealing with the same challenge because um, we have a lot of government contracts, and they are getting reduced, and we need to focus on private philanthropy, and that's where these monthly meetings to talk about, you know, uh, different opportunities, because they know they have these cuts to their departments and their programs, and they don't want to cut, but they have to. So I said, well, let's talk about alternative ways to bring in funds. So again, it's, it's about communication, it's about education, it's about thinking outside the box. Right. Like yeah, I, I, I do want to say, though, for those of us who, are, who do, do have large government contracts, you know, we, we need those contracts. You can't provide daycare and you can't do, you know, supportive housing or whatever without these contracts, right? And we won't get into, you know, what that means in terms of democracy in the United States right now, but uh, <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll give you my opinion afterward. <laughs> but, um, but it's very challenging. It reminds me actually of, is it Life of Brian, where they keep cutting off the body limbs and we just keep going. And what I realized at the end is, yeah, we have to have that dialogue, but there are limitations to how much we can raise for Head Start and, uh, and, and whatever it is, and mental health services and such. Right. And at a certain point, uh, and, and as, a, as an executive director, I had, I, you know, I had to make these decisions. You, you, gotta, you have to cut the programs soon enough that they don't kill the rest of the agency because you can't be, you know, what happens is we're, we're always behind the eight ball on this. Then they get cut a bit. We decide not to cut the program, but try and fund it. And then there's more pressure on the fundraising staff. And then we're trying to raise money for need. And it's, it's this emergency money, which is much harder to raise than vision money. And mm -hmm. it becomes a vicious cycle. And I see some of you nodding for those of us who are in social service. I mean, it drove me crazy with that, right? And then you don't even get your contract till halfway through the year. You've provided the service, then they tell you, well, we can't pay for all that service because you didn't meet certain standards, which you couldn't have met before the year starts. So I think part of it is actually making sure that the rest of the executive staff understands the need to sharpen those pencils sooner than later, because otherwise it does end up on the shoulders of the fundraising staff. And there's just so much you can do when you're a government contract uh, 
uh, heavy, and those are the programs you provide. Another question. Executive director. Yeah. It's, it has to be the executive director. It has to start from the top. I mean, if you're a fund, if you're the head fundraiser and you're in a shop where the executive director is not supporting the fundraising efforts, I don't know where you go from there. I mean, like a lone ranger, it's not. I it mean, if the if the executive director isn't supporting it, how much access are you really going to have to the board, and how is the board going to perceive you if the executive director isn't setting you up that way and setting the example? Uh, it has to start. I think it's the executive so, director. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what does a person do who is not, you know, at the highest level of the food chain, yeah, yeah, yeah. and well. they're not the Advice when you're not at the executive director level, right. or you're not the head, you're not reporting directly to the executive director. You're saying, or you are. Well, Is it? Just lower down the food chain, right? Yeah. Well, it's it's very you know if it, if you're lower down and you can't get the person above you to recognize the need to get to the executive director, I this is you know corporate culture. I don't. It's very challenging. Uh, I mean, you, you I might, mean, just to add to that, I mean, I've worked in institutions where it was just at some point, you know, you just say, you know, this, this marriage is not going to work. I mean, uh, you know, and you have to sort of smile and do your best That's and reality. look for another yeah, job. I, I mean, to. at some point, the organization, I mean, we can all look for excuses all the time for why we don't succeed. There's always, there's always challenges. It's just the nature of life and the nature of work. But in some organizations, there's almost a pathological desire to fail at fundraising yeah, yeah, and yeah. to get in the way of fundraising. <laughs> and, um, and when you're in that culture, it's just, you know, you're sort of, I mean, I made the mistake earlier in my career of thinking I was the one who was going to change this organization from the development director's uh, seat. And I realized, you know, something it's, you know, if a person's been failing at fundraising for 20 years as a director because they're a megalomaniac and won't allow, um, Hypothetically, <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> then you know it's yeah. you know it's, at some point you have to say you know so it's not going to this is not going to change and um, I'm going to smile and start looking around for another job because there's a lot of great there organizations of great yeah. that need your help and that are you we'll know, respect yeah. what you have I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll respect yeah. what you have to bring yeah, yeah that's the beauty of our business I have to say I mean with all the recessions and everything I, people said oh are you hot suffering I said not really because when things are good there's a lot of money to raise. And they need us, and when things are bad, it's harder to raise, and they need yeah. us, and, and and they're going to have to shut the doors if they don't hire right. us. I mean, it, it's I've always felt a certain job security, and that there are a lot of right. tremendous jobs out there, and I have also left more than one job because the culture wasn't going to change, and and I couldn't be the lone ranger anymore. Stephanie, you have a question. So I think as fundraisers, we often feel persecuted, and. Uh, <laughs> but also, I'm Right. We feel we are making these institutions possible to a great extent, mm -hmm. but there are some natural barriers. Like I remember when I was in-house, fundraisers on a different floor, and often paid at a higher grade level than program line staff who sets up, you know, mm -hmm. a competition yes. of sorts. And but when trying to foster this communication, it always felt a little one-sided to me. Like we need something from everybody else. But what can we as fundraisers, I like Brian's mention of showing how the money circles back, but what, what can we give these other areas of staff that makes them feel like they're more a part of, like it's more of a quid pro quo and not something else they have to add to their job to make our job easier? How do we, how do we make that relationship smoother at the outset? I, I think part of it is, and, and again, it, you know, it's always easier just to try to do things ourselves, and we are often tempted to do that. And I think the example of the proposal writing is, is a great example. To the extent that you, that we can remember to include our colleagues at every level of the process, whether that means, get, you know, m making sure that they feel heard and bought in to the question of what are we trying to raise money for, what are your priorities. I learned a long time ago, as probably most people in this room have, that trying to force uh, 
a project that a funder is interested in, but the program staff is not interested in, it's just going to lead to woe for everyone in the end. Um, so we, you know, we learn not to do that. But then, to the extent that the program staff people can meet the funder, can feel like they're uh, giving input that's being heard, can go to the, you know, can come along to the cocktail reception where you're going to be, you know, you get two tickets to something where the, the person is being honored and you bring those people along and demystify it, make them feel like they're your colleague and that the glamorous, you know, parts of our jobs, so to speak, uh, you know, that we're willing to share that and not, you know, sometimes I feel like we, you know, we're trying to pretend we're not doing is just going out and begging people for money all the time. So we try to make it seem glamorous and we don't want to let other people into this process because they'll see un how unglamorous it really is. But let's just, you know, let's just let our hair down and let people see this is, you know, what we're doing is we're just trying to build relationships and trying to bring people at every level into that process, uh, I think, you know, is helpful. Let's go to another question. Yes, please. Uh, so my question is a little bit related. I'm curious, we've spoken a lot about the culture of fundraising, and I'm curious how important you think an integrated strategy is that involves fundraising. I think, it's, I, I think it's going to be critical, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to certainly open it to the panel. The creating the culture throughout to, to, to develop a, more of a major gift and individual giving program. I'd ask, where's the board? On it? You mentioned the staff, but when it comes to major gifts, I hate to open that Pandora's box, but where's, uh, where's the board? Do you, want, do you want to tell us? Uh, we're working in progress. Okay. I think they understand the importance of it. Mm -hmm. Understanding is actual mm -hmm. I think it's much wider than they think. <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. Yeah, work in progress. Because I think that's where you'll find more um, hands eventually for the major gift work. Um, I mean, it, I, I, the integration of it, I mean, um, on the communications front, what are you hoping would happen? Well, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if they're if they're participating in visits and they're going to events and they're being charming, um, it sounds like they're doing a pretty good job. Uh, uh, you know, loving fundraising. You know, I'm fascinated by fundraising, um, and I love the impact I've made. I don't love fundraising, and I've done for 30 years. I do because I care, and a lot of people do. So getting others who aren't even in the profession to love it, boy, that's a tall order. <laughs> we I, to, just, uh, can, can you do it briefly? I'll do my best. So I just want to add one thing to that, which is that, um, you know, I've worked in smaller organizations. I mean, I've worked in very small organizations, but I, in the last job I was at before I came to BAM, I had a much, much smaller staff. And it was only after I left it that I realized a lot of what we were trying to do was just too much. That I was really, that at BAM, I'm doing the same exact things that I tried to do at my last job, but with more success because I have the staff. So just a, an example is, you know, we have a dinner and then we do a little research profile on everyone who's coming to the dinner. That that was just too much. We just couldn't get it together. We didn't have enough staff to, to do a little research profile on everyone who's coming to a dinner and do all the follow-up. And the people who were coming to the dinner expect to sort of have, have the same experience in either case. And so, Setting the right expectations, I think, is, is very important, and not thinking, well, this is the way 
BAM or the Metropolitan Museum of Art does it or, you know, whatever, some other large organization. So we ought to do it that way too, setting up expectations that the staff can't live up to and then feel frustrated by is a great point. At some point you have to say, well, where, you know, given the limited resources, where can we focus and how much can we really expect people to be involved in as much as we'd love to do. And I see, I see the prize out there and I'd like to get it, but if I, you know, if we put, I put my colleagues in this position, they're going to get frustrated. Uh, then we have to say, well, I guess you know we'll have to put that off and wait. And it's difficult. It's fun reasons we don't want to wait. We you know we want to get it, but uh, I think we do have to be realistic about what we can pull off. Terry, do you want to add? I would just say um, again, you can only bite off as much as you can chew. I mean, and it sounds like your staff is doing a lot. The the other staff is doing a lot, and you don't want to wreck the relationship that you have already. Oh, another thing they need to do for you. So I would just be careful of that. Let's try one more. So you have a question? I was just going to comment uh, okay. on what can development do for other departments. And one of the things that we can do is highlight their successes, whether that's, whether that's you know, through a visit, uh, could be featuring an article in a newsletter, sending out a blast. And I think people like having that recognition, and that's going to create alliances. And when you need something, from that staff member, they're going to say, "Oh yeah, I kind of, you know, they were good to me. I can be good to, I, I can be good to you. One again washes the other." So I think we do have, because we're good at that. We're good at celebrating successes and getting those stories out there to people. And people like to be recognized. I'm going to ask you to uh, join me in uh, thanking our panel: <laughs> Terry Billy, Matt Bregman, and Brian Saber. Thank you very much. I'm impressed by how many people stayed. When I host events, I have to do the raffle at the end. Because that's the only way to keep people. Every, the raffle at the beginning, and, and uh, everyone stayed. I love it. Well, thank you very much again, uh, Association of Fundraising Professionals, New York City chapter. Thanks so much for hosting us. Adrian, thank you very much. Thank you.